Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome again to the Catskill Regional Agricultural Conference, Dr. Robert Lynch uh, from the uh, Pro Dairy Program uh, uh, through Cornell University. Uh, Dr. Lynch uh, is a native of New York State, grew up in Elmira and uh, uh, had his undergraduate work at RIT and then his uh, veterinary degree from Tufts University. He worked in private practice as a vet uh, for eight years in Southeast Pennsylvania, working with both large, uh, uh, with all large animals with an emphasis on dairy. He then worked in the, uh, as a support in the industry for a number of years, both for Pfizer and Zoetis, providing dairy technical support uh, in, uh, across the Northeast US, and then joined our pro dairy team in 2016. And we have really uh, uh, been greatly uh, uh, grateful for having him join us as a resource uh, and helping us with our farms. We've had him out here in Delaware County a number of times. And we've asked him to talk today uh, to revisit a topic that we've had him speak on in the past because we felt it was very relevant and very important. Uh, and that is talking about uh, immune function in, uh, in dairy cattle, especially in, in, um, as we look forward to having these animals uh, have a great lactation. And so with no further ado, uh, Dr. Lynch, I'll turn it over to you, stop my screen share and let you, uh, Need to make you a co-host. I'm sorry. That's all right. Lots of lots of buttons to push. <laughs> and you're set. All right. Now let me make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. Switch. All right. Are you looking at full screen or a presenter view? Presenter view. And how about now? That looks good. Great. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, attending this afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Paul, and the rest of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Delaware County for inviting me to participate again in this, in this year's Regional Ag Conference. Um, um, my section, uh, we're going to zero in on immunology and vaccines. And uh, I know we, we talked a bit about this, uh, Paul and I, when we were um, coming up with topics. And nothing is more front and center right now in everyone's mind than immunology and vaccines. We kind of see what's going on with this pandemic still and vaccination rates and how well protected those who are vaccinated are against the virus and how we still have breakthroughs even though some are vaccinated. Um, and so we're, we're just learning a ton about how the immune system works and, and how vaccines can protect a population. So I'm gonna um, kind of go over a bit, bit of an outline here um, we're going to talk about immune su suppression because, you know, we see, hear about this in the news as well. You know, we're trying to prevent exposure to those who are immune suppressed um, to COVID. So, you know, there's a lot of things we can do with our herd management to minimize the degree of immune suppression that the, uh, our, our cows experience. And then there's things we can do to reduce exposure to disease. So we'll talk a little bit about those. And then I think it's helpful to talk about you know, the, the culprits, what are the diseases that are most concerned for dairy farms here in the region? Um, I'm not going to cover all of them. I'm just going to hit on a couple of the big ones and the ones that you often see listed on your, your vaccine bottles. And then we're going to get right into how we use vaccines. And then I'll, I'll wrap things up with some of the common things you run into with just, you know, issues around how vaccines are used on the farms, just some common practical things to consider when you uh, um, get back into the barn. So you may, if anyone's attended a immunology presentation by me before, probably seen this slide. I'd like to sort of set the stage of, just to describe what our goals really are when, we, when we're trying to build vaccine programs. And so you could sort of imagine, you know, there's a sort of a disease presence in the immediate environment, and then you have your immune system. And as long as your immune system is operating above the disease exposure, you tend to stay healthy. But some things can go wrong with that. Uh, sometimes there's just too much exposure, uh, too much virus in the in immediate environment, too much bacteria. And even though the immune system didn't change, the level of exposure increased and it overwhelmed our immune system when we got sick. Um, you can kind of think of that cow that got mastitis in the quarter that we forgot to prep that teat before attaching the milking unit. Too much bacteria um, going up the teat end 
um, her immune system didn't change, but there was just too much disease to fend off. So she ends up getting mastitis. Uh, the opposite can happen where the disease was always there. There was no additional exposure. It wasn't overwhelming, um, but the immune system failed to prevent the animal from getting sick because the immune system wasn't operating um, 100%. And so things that can suppress the immune system, we'll, we'll talk about a bunch of those in a bit. Uh, but if we lower her ability to resist disease and kind of think of yourself when it's corn harvest time, uh, you're burning the candle at both ends, getting very little sleep, probably not eating very well. And probably that's a, that's a time when you're also likely to come down with a cold or something. You may have resisted it otherwise, but you got run down and ended up getting sick. What we really want to do in a herd health program is we want to minimize the stressors, so keep the immune system as strong as possible. We could even build up some protection specifically against the diseases that we're most worried about to heighten our immune function. And we also want to, we want to lower as much as we can of the disease exposure, the disease risk. And we do that with good biosecurity programs, with good hygiene. Um, and I look at the, the, the difference between these two um, level of immunity and level of disease exposure is you know, the wider we make that gap, that's a, that's a well-functioning herd health program. So there are all sorts of things that can impact um, and a cow's immune system. And so just uh, you know, general categories, we look at good nutrition, um, general deficiencies, um, obviously will weaken the immune system, um, inadequate access to feed will um, create uh, energy and protein deficiencies and lower her ability to resist disease. Um, and then very specific nutrient deficiencies. I just included selenium here, but there are a bunch that if there's something specifically lacking in the diet that plays a critical role in how the immune cells function uh, can also lead to uh, immune suppression. And then probably the biggest nutrient when we think of the immune uh, system goes uh, we, is colostrum. And so obviously we wanna make sure these calves get off to a good start with a good dose of colostrum. Um, environmental stressors, um, heat stress in the milking herd in the summer, cold stress, uh, we're about to hit another cold snap here in the next few days. And so we know that um, calves can get stressed uh, if they don't have enough, um, enough protections out there to um, keep them warm. Um, and then just things like overcrowded um, pens and uh, constant reshuffling and, and re-socialization of cows within the herd all create um, stressors and can suppress her immune system. Any other disease uh, that happens to be going on in the animal can lower her ability to fight off other diseases. Um, things like parasites in the gut, um, BVD virus infections, Yoni's infections, um, ketosis, uh, those animals don't resist other diseases very well if they also have ketosis. And cows with low blood calciums, um, we need calcium for the immune system to function. And then there's the management things that we do that, um, you know, they're inevitable. We have to do, do these things at some point, but we can do them in a way to minimize stress on the animal. Things like weaning strategies, are what, pro what protocols we follow when we do dehornings, um, and, or, you know, and, and when we move animals around, uh, long haul transportation, things like that can, can uh, suppress the immune system. And then one that we really can't do much about is um, calving. So we know that's a, it's a stressful time in the cow's life and in the calf's life, uh, probably the most stress they'll ever experience is at that point in time. And there is an immune suppression that occurs both in the cow and in the calf at this, at this period in time. So we try to manage the others because we know this one is something we um, have a hard time controlling. So I mentioned colostrum. And so kind of starting off with a good immune system, starting off with calves that aren't immune suppressed, uh, we do that by um, increasing the likelihood of a, a successful transfer of passive immunity. Um, and we know that those cows, calves that get good colostrum um, don't get sick as much, uh, they have lower mortality, and they tend to just do better uh, as animals uh, for the rest of their life. So definitely gets them off to a good start and gets them out of that high risk neonatal window. Um, and we can do this just by, you know, practicing good colostrum management. I'm not going to get into all of the steps of good colostrum management because uh, this is a talk about uh, vaccines, but, um, you know, certainly worth reviewing how calves are receiving their colostrum to make sure that it's happening in a way that's um, going to lead to good passive transfers.
You can evaluate your success in this area. Um, if you're not already doing this, you can, you can sample some of your uh, week old calves or you can test all of your week old calves. Um, usually uh, we'd like to test them somewhere between 24 hours of age and seven days of age. And we like to select healthy, you know, apparently healthy calves. So we avoid testing calves that have, may already be dehydrated from diarrhea. Um, it, it's nice to test them about an hour and a half or so after their last milk feeding to make sure that they're you know, hydrated maximally. Um, and we can evaluate their, um, their serum protein levels and correlate that to how many, um, what her level of immunoglobulin is in her bloodstream. This is a recent um, study or a comp compilation from Jason Lombard, um, just looking at instead of our single cut point of we want we want um, uh, we want like ninety percent of our animals above a serum IgG of ten. Um, this looks at how well a herd is doing on a passive transfer basis, and so you can see the passive transfer immunity co or column on the left. And the bottom in red is poor. So we can see that we really, if we're not managing our colostrum very well, um, we're going to have more than 10% of our calves when we do those blood tests uh, in that uh, poor category of less than 10 um, grams per liter IgG or less than 5.1 on a, a total solids basis. Her, herds that are really doing well, and they're, when they're testing their calves, they're finding better than 40% of their calves testing 6.2 or even higher on a total solids basis. And so, you know, evaluating your classroom program by testing your, your calves after the fact is a nice way to see how, how well are we doing at getting antibodies into our calves. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist, uh, but we can look at this, you know, very you know, initial uh, nutrition plan for calves within, this is, I just did an example here using the NRC calculator. This is so a week old calf um, put in hundred pounds and I plugged in a 2020 milk replacer, uh, which provided a pound and a half pounds of powder to that calf every day. And the red bars show what her maintenance energy requirements are against various outside temperatures. So 60 degrees on the left, all the way down to zero degrees, which we're definitely going to see here in a couple of days. And so you can see here, I, obviously her energy requirements will go up substantially as outside you know, temperatures decline. So that doesn't, and if we don't change our diet at all, um, the, the nutrient that's left over for growth and the nutrient that's left over for all kinds of functions and the immune system requires energy. And so if we don't have enough energy around, um, immune suppression usually will set in because there's just not enough groceries to, to support it. So we can see as those temperatures go down, the, the amount of energy left over for growth goes down. And if we just use growth as our target, I put a dotted line in here that shows if, we're, if we want 1.6, 1.7 pounds per day, average daily gain, this particular diet never does achieve it. Um, and it falls way short as it gets colder. And once we get down to like 10 degrees or less, then we're now we're looking at body weight loss and calves just don't have uh, those excess body weights to, to spare. We can improve the immediate environment for these calves with lots of good bedding in the wintertime. So um, you can evaluate how well you're bedding your calf pens by doing nesting scores. Um, this was developed um, by Sheila McGurk, University of Wisconsin. And it's crude. You're just looking at how much of this calf is exposed when, when she's laying down in the bedding. Um, and if she's completely on top of the bedding and you can see her entire legs as she's laying down, um, we would score that a one. Uh, and if, if I have a hard time finding legs on calves that are laying down, that would be a nesting score of three. And if you're going down the row of pens, um, the most frequently observed score um, is your barn score, your barn nesting score. You'll notice there's jackets on many of these calves. So if you're you know, adding jackets to the calves, you can, you can bump your bedding score up by a score of one uh, for that calf because um, that jacket's gonna help, help that calf preserve some more body heat. On to the milking herd. Um, we know um, as cows calve in, um, they're in a negative energy balance situation. Um, we hope to get them back up and eating well and get in a positive plan of nutrition and avoid some of the consequences of excessive fat mobilization. Um, they break down too much body fat, they mobilize too many um, ketone bodies, and we end up with 
uh, subclinical ketosis, clinical ketosis. Um, if we can't get ahead of that ketosis problem, her liver really starts to struggle and um, those, those cows don't tend to make it. Um, negative energy balance um, associated with subclinical ketosis, we know um, it's very prevalent. Um, uh, last um, study, Jess McCart looked at the average incidence of subclinical ketosis in a group of herds and that came in at 43%. Um, which is which is quite high. Uh, we know that cows with subclinical ketosis don't make as much milk. Um, they don't tend to breed very well. And they also are increased risk of other diseases and that's associated with that negative energy balance and immune suppression. We know that negative energy balance happens pre-calving as well. It's not just a fresh cow problem. So cows that are breaking down excessive body fat pre-calving, um, we know those, those animals are also set up for um, immune suppression and, and they're gonna struggle once they hit the milking herd. So we try to manage these, um, these cows as best we can to minimize the negative energy balance so we don't have immune suppression and, and more disease in our fresh cows. So in order to lower a disease exposure, we can, uh, can look at biosecurity measures. So biosecurity, those are the steps that we take to keep disease off the farm. If I don't have the disease on my farm already, I wanna make sure that I've got some safety measures in place to keep it from gaining entry. Um, and that's, you know, we do things like, and I'll talk about BVD in a minute, but we'll, we'll test newborn calves for BVD infection. Um, we, can, we can screen bulk tank milk or do um, individual cow milk cultures looking for contagious mastitis. Uh, there's, there's things we can do to try to find disease to prevent it from getting into the herd and, and, and spreading. Once a disease is on the farm, then we can talk about biocontainment. And now it's already on the farm, we just wanna limit how far it spreads and try to minimize unnecessary exposures to other animals within the herd, particularly the most susceptible animals in the herd. So what can I do on my farm to minimize exposing my fresh cows uh, to disease, and what can I do to minimize exposing my newborn calves to disease? So there's lots of hygiene steps and um, cleanliness that we can um, employ to prevent unnecessary exposure. Something as basic as just milking gloves, changing coveralls, um, good boot washing systems to try to cut down on the trafficking of bugs we already know are on the farm. If, if, I'm, if I'm treating a cow for pneumonia, um, and then I go and feed my calves their, their afternoon milk, um, I may be carrying that pneumonia-causing pathogen on my clothes, on my hands, and exposing my, my, my susceptible calves accidentally. So we want to try to keep that um, to a minimum by just following some good um, biocontainment and hygiene measures. So let's talk about the diseases of concern. And these aren't all of them. Uh, these are the ones that I, I think of first, and these are the ones you probably see on your vaccine bottles. Um, and I broke them down into core and risk-based. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, where that comes from later on. But when I say core, I mean, I probably get myself a little bit of trouble by saying that these I feel should be in all vaccine programs because no single vaccine protocol should, um, is the same from one farm to the next. Um, but we think of core as like these are these diseases are just really they're they're prevalent they're out there they're hard to keep off the farm and so we're going to probably include these in most of our vaccine programs and so we've got you know IBR and BVD and I'll talk about those in a little bit uh, parainfluenza virus bovine respiratory syncytial virus uh, multiple strains of leptospires um, and coliform mastitis and then risk based. Um, and we probably argue a little bit about maybe some of these should be over in core and, and, and maybe not in a risk-based category, but risk-based means that we've discussed it, we've analyzed it for a farm's particular situation and have determined that on this farm, this disease probably should be included in, in their vaccine program. And the farm down the street, we do the same risk analysis. We may come up with the answer that doesn't make sense to use this vaccine here. So um, we do a risk analysis and we figure out, are these should these be included in the program as well? And those are our clostridials, um, the pathogens that cause calf diarrhea, and then some of our bacterial pneumonias like Mannheimia, Pasteurella, um, may, um, we may, we, there may be occasions where we, we consider adding those to a, to a farm's vaccine program. 
So I think it helps to know a little bit about the enemy. And I've included a couple of more recent um, studies just evaluating how well um, vaccines in these for these diseases actually hold up. Because I think it's, it's not unusual for folks to wonder, is it worth the hassle? Is it worth the expense? I, I, you know, I spend a lot of money on my vaccines. And I, I know I give, a, I give a lot of shots to these animals. Is it, am I really, am I really helping the herd by, by giving these vaccines? So I think it, it helps to, you know, look at all these steps with a, with a, with a cold eye. So infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, there are many strains of herpes virus, but bovine herpes virus one is the one that we think about when it comes to respiratory disease in cattle. Um, the pathology picture on the right is a rather consolidated lung with a really nasty uh, tracheitis and a lot, of, a lot of hemorrhage in those airways and uh, uh, very, <laughs> very little normal lung tissue left to let that cow breathe. Um, and so it does create a pretty nasty respiratory situation. We tend to think of IBR as an abortion disease. And I'll, I have a, efficacy, uh, a meta-analysis to share with you in a bit here about how these vaccines can help avoid IBR-related abortion. Um, I, IBR, even though we've been vaccinated against it quite heavily for many years, is still quite prevalent. Um, found in roughly 20 to 60% of animals tested. And if we look at that at the herd level, more than 70% of herds uh, in this um, review um, showed um, seroconversion to IBR. And these were non-vaccinated herds. So we know it's out there. Um, this was a meta-analysis that just looked at all the various efficacy trials uh, that were in the literature. And they boiled them down in this meta-analysis. They started with, I don't know, probably close to 90 um, and boiled it down to how did this vaccine do to prevent abortion? And did this study have enough rigor um, associated with it to meet the inclusion criteria? And when they boiled it all down, they ended up with about 15 studies in their meta-analysis. And this is a forest plot that I'm showing. And basically you look at that dotted line along the one. Um, and if you're, your confidence intervals stay below that one, um, that's considered a significant reduction in risk. And if your confidence intervals keep you above the number of one, it means there's a significant increase in relative risk of disease. And so this was a, looking at vaccinated versus non-vaccinated, um, what happened to the relative risk associated with having an abortion to IBR. And um, if we just zero in on the overall, because I don't want to get into the, you know, each individual study here, but it did show that overall modified live vaccinated animals or animals vaccinated with a killed IBR vaccine were at significant lower risk for abortion following a viral IBR challenge. And that reduction was a good about 60% on average. And so we know that these vaccines are really helping us avoid abortion. It's not 100%. Uh, but there's a significant reduction there. And the uh, latest economic analysis I could find on what that means for a dairy, we know that when a, a pregnancy is lost, on average, it, it costs a dairy about 500 bucks. Um, it, it varies on stage of lactation and um, where uh, age of the animal when the abortion occurred. But you know, on average, we know that when it, we lose a pregnancy, it's quite expensive. I'm gonna move on to BVD virus. Uh, so, um, this one's not quite as prevalent out there, but it is still there and we are still, labs are still finding uh, PI calves and we're still dealing with um, BVD related infertility issues on farms. So it's a pestivirus. It comes in a couple of different types, type one, type two BVD. You'll see that on your vaccine bottles. Um, we can also categorize it as cytopathic or non-cytopathic. And that's typically a, a, how it behaves in the lab distinction. But we just also remember that the, it's the non-cytopathic uh, BVD virus that results in our, our persistently infected calves. And I'll talk about how that happens in a second here. BVD as a disease, uh, we think of fever, immune suppression, depression, they go off feed. Um, and sometimes um, they really can get into some really nasty situations of you know, concurrent um, BVD infections with um, mucosal disease, with oral erosions. Um, you don't tend to think of BVD as a diarrhea virus. Um, when they have diarrhea from BVD virus, probably they are, they are quite ill. Um, BVD tends to just be an immune suppressor, and these animals succumb to other diseases because the immune system is, is so consumed by the BVD virus. But our primary, I guess, problem with BVD virus on dairies is infertility. 
And so we deal with um, low fertility and low pregnancy rates. Um, we often wonder, um, is BVD somehow at, at play here? And we wanna make sure that it's not circulating within the herd. This little diagram in the top right is just, there are so many subspecies, subvarieties of BVD virus. And, um, so it's sometimes it's hard to keep them all straight. So how does BVD um, circulate within the dairy? How does it, how does it get in? Um, so just think of an animal. I got a calf shown here on the slide and she happens to get exposed to BVD virus. And when you have a BVD virus infection, you shed it. You shed it in your oral secretions and your manure and your urine and semen. You, you're just exuding BVD virus while, you, while you're trying to fight the virus and clear it. But that whole time you're shedding that virus into your environment, you're sharing it to your, with your herd mates. And so you may expose a cow that is susceptible to BVD virus. She picks up that BVD virus and she now is viremic. Viremia is just virus in the bloodstream. So while she's trying to get rid of that virus infection, the virus is circulating within her bloodstream. It may travel to uh, her uterus where if she happens to be pregnant and developing a fetus, she's going to expose that fetus to the BVD virus. And here's where the, the consequences of the BVD infection um, can, can come in. Uh, it can eliminate um, the pregnancy. It could cause an abortion or a stillbirth. Um, that's very costly to the dairy. Um, if the infection is very late in gestation, um, we may see just more of like a weak or deformed calf when it's born. So it's also a total loss. Um, cat, very late infections after a calf that developing fetus already has a functioning immune system, um, that calf may be born normal and healthy with, with no consequences. The real problem here with the virus is this persistent infection um, phenomenon that happens that if this developing fetus is exposed to BVD virus, while its immune system is under development, so it's like middle gestation, um, the calf sees this virus itself. And so when it's born, it's born with BVD virus, it's shedding BVD virus, and it will never get rid of the virus because it thinks it's just part of its normal makeup, its normal tissues. And so that persistently infected calf now happily shedding virus uh, to the rest of the herd, um, wherever she happens to go. Um, we'd like to think that these are poor doers and they kind of call themselves out of the herd and that does happen sometimes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes these calves do just fine um, even though they continually shed BVD virus within the herd. So this is a meta-analysis, um, uh, same, uh, same person, uh, different publication, uh, but they looked at um, a, a meta-analysis of, I think they've got about 44 studies included in this, um, um, this meta-analysis of efficacy of BVD vaccinations, um, looking at vaccinates versus unvaccinates, um, what happened from a fetal infection, what happened in abortion rate, and what happened to pregnancy rate when we compare the vaccinates to the unvaccinates. And we can see about an 85% reduction in fetal infection. So that's either PI or born positive to virus if uh, uh, exposed later to a BVD challenge. Um, an abortion rate reduction of about 45% or well, not a significant difference in overall pregnancy risk. Uh, but in the studies that were field challenge, which is kind of more typical of what we would see in the real world, um, there was a 5% improvement in pregnancy risk or, or pregnancy rate. So we know that BVD uh, vaccine um, can be a real risk reducer uh, in our herds. That's why it's part of most vaccine programs. Uh, moving on to mastitis. Uh, we know that coliform mastitis is an, kind of one of those things where um, I, I can't I can't think of a farm that hasn't had a case of coliform mastitis, unfortunately. And so we know it's there. And so I like to include uh, coliform mastitis vaccines as part of a core vaccine program. And the upper right uh, is a efficacy trial way back. Uh, Jim Culler and Ruben Gonzalez were involved in this one. I think it was part of the initial approval of one of the J5 vaccines. Um, and it showed uh, about a five-fold um, decrease in coliform mastitis risk we look at animals vaccinated against coliform mastitis versus those who are not vaccinated. Uh, more recent um, efficacy uh, approval type studies were done to show that you know, there, there is a, a health sparing effect with these vaccines. We may not stop the infection, but we can stop the severity. And that's really where um, this disease gets quite costly when they, the cows get toxic. And you know, you've seen these toxic coliform and Klebsiella mastitis 
type mastitis cases, they, they do uh, get quite sick. Um, unfortunately, the memory to this vaccine is a little bit short. I'll talk about how memory is formed in a bit. Um, and so we do have to kind of remind the immune system of this vaccine more frequently than we tend to see with others. And so we typically, these vaccines are administered right around dry off, a little bit halfway through the dry period. And then sometimes we'll add a, a third dose somewhere about a week or two after, after she's calved in. There are other mastitis vaccines out there. Uh, Staph aureus and mycoplasma, I believe, are on the market. Uh, still have not come across a very convincing data to show me that either of those are um, really going to uh, really um, useful as part of a preventive strategy. So um, I don't have any information on those. Moving on to Scour's vaccines. Um, we could probably argue maybe this should be part of everybody's vaccine program, but um, I, you know, I think it, it, I put it in the risk-based category because it, it probably should be there. But uh, these are complicated vaccines, so I thought I'd talk about how they work. Um, we're, we're vaccinating a cow to protect her calf that hasn't been born yet. That's, <laughs> if you think about it, that's, a, that's pretty unusual. Um, and so we have to administer these vaccines in a timely manner to let the cow have time to make antibodies so it can get into her colostrum so then it can then make it to the calf. So we think way back around dry off um, when we're starting this, this uh, Scours vaccine uh, booster. And because we know cows start trafficking antibodies from their bloodstream into their mammary gland, you know, starting around five to six weeks before she calves in. So we, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a a built-in race here where I got to get the immune system stimulated prior to this transport of antibodies in the mammary gland if I really want to get the most bang for my buck with this vaccine. So she's going to generate antibodies based on that uh, uh, immunization, hopefully, and then she's going to move those antibodies into her colostrum when she makes colostrum for her calf. And then this step, which can be hard in some places, um, we got to get it into the calf. And so if we're not doing a great job of getting colostrum into calves, Maybe a scours vaccine into the dry cows just doesn't make a lot of sense because we have to they have either fix that situation or think of something maybe I can give more directly to the calf. Then we have our, our replacement heifers and they've never seen this vaccine before and, and most scours vaccines are um, require a booster. So now we have to go back another two, three, four weeks prior to that, that uh, booster dose in order to prime the immune system in these animals that have never seen Scour's vaccine before. And sometimes that window of time is not a real convenient <laughs> time to handle my, my pregnant heifers. And so it's very tricky trying to fit some of these strategies into our current management uh, plans. If this, do, if this is done well though, that we're, we can consistently deliver the antibodies that we intended to um, when we use the Scour's vaccine. This is a, a very new um, uh, research trial looking at rotavirus um, antibodies and what kind of protection they offered uh, calves that received those rotavirus uh, antibodies after being exposed to a rotavirus challenge. And so uh, we know that um, diarrhea is a big problem on uh, pre-weaned dairy heifers. It's responsible for more than half of pre-weaned heifer deaths. Um, and the bugs that we think of mostly when it comes to calf diarrhea, rotavirus, coronavirus, coliform, and crypto. Um, and so this is just a rotavirus challenge. I didn't, I'm not gonna get into the other bugs. Um, so this challenge study uh, wanted to just evaluate um, what kind of health improvement could we expect to see when we give her, basically provide orally administered rotavirus antibodies, which is exactly what we do when we're feeding calves colostrum. We're, giving them orally. Uh, antibodies developed elsewhere, we're um, administering them orally. So they had, you know, I'm not going to get all the, the, the nuts and bolts of the trial, but they caught calves as they were being delivered. And they took 83 of these bull calves, deprived them of colostrum, um, and then allocated them into three different study groups. We have this colostrum deprived group. Um, I think in the handout, this is labeled MR, because instead of colostrum, um, these calves received just milk replacer. Um, and so that's one third of the calves. Then we've got our um, antibody, specific antibodies calves. So these calves uh, labeled ABS received just a milk replacer. And then they got a 
uh, rotavirus specific dose of antibodies. So they didn't get colostrum, they just got rotavirus antibodies. And then we've got this colostrum replacer group that received a, a commercial colostrum replacer that had E. coli and coronavirus antibodies in it. Plus they received this rotavirus specific antibody preparation. And then um, the next day they were challenged with an orally administered rotavirus strain, you know, a strain that causes disease. We wanted to see how well these calves did. So the chart on the left, uh, this shows um, what percent of the calves were scored, a severe diarrhea score, and then what day of the study um, did, did they receive that initial score of severe diarrhea. So you can see that those colostrum deprived, deprived calves in red, um, they're the highest percentage of those calves scored severe diarrhea and it happened pretty quick, about a day or two um, after challenge. The calves that didn't get colostrum but did get rotavirus antibodies, um, a lower percentage of them scored a uh, severe diarrhea score, and it was delayed to about two and a half to three and a half days post challenge. And then the yellow line are those are our colostrum calves that got both the rotavirus antibodies and colostrum replacer. And you can see that they um, very few of them scored a severe diarrhea score. Uh, the chart on the right uh, shows a survival curve. Um, what proportion of the calves were um, had a did um, were without a diarrhea diagnosis. And so at the very start of the trial, none of them had a diarrhea diagnosis. And you could see those in the red line, the clustered deprived calves uh, very quickly um, started with diarrhea, usually around day one, day two. Um, and all of them um, scored a diarrhea score at some point in the trial. Um, the ones that just received rotavirus antibodies along with their milk replacer, um, a little delayed on, um, their diarrhea onset, and the a small percentage never progressed um, to not have it. A very small percentage got through without diarrhea. And then the group that did get colostrum along with the rotavirus antibodies, um, quite protective. Only 40% of those were scored with a diarrhea by the end of the, the one week study period. Uh, and then the trial ended and they were um, euthanized and uh, sampled and all that good stuff. So both the um, calves that just got rotavirus antibodies and the group that got colostrum replacer and rotavirus antibodies showed a reduced age of onset, a reduced duration of diarrhea, and a reduced severity of diarrhea um, when challenged against with the challenge with a rotavirus challenge uh, compared to calves that did not. So we know that these, um, if we can deliver colostrum in a um, well to our calves, we know that these um, antibody um, preparations uh, can be beneficial. So with the time I have remaining, I'm going to get into how the immune system works and then some things that we can uh, do to better ensure that we're getting the best we can out of our vaccines. So we've got, um, you know, immunology 101, you know, so we have an, an innate immune system um, and then we have uh, an adapted or um, uh, applied immune system. So in the innate immunity, we think of everything that can keep disease um, away. And that those are things that you may not even consider like physical barriers, um, an intact skin, intact hide um, that keeps disease out. Um, we've got nonspecific immune protection in our airways and in the lining of our gut. Um, we've got high hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. You know, we have things that aren't even really cell derived that are keeping disease from gaining entry. And then we do have nonspecific cells within the immune system um, that they don't really care what the bug is. Um, their job is to start the process of eliminating it. Um, they're not really super efficient at it, um, but they're also not real picky as to what the virus or what the bacteria is when it, when it happens to get through some of these initial barriers and get, it, get into, the, into the animal. Uh, after the innate immune system, we have our adaptive immune system. And so we can break, um, and adaptive just means that it, it adapts. It, it responds to specific pathogens and, and, and gets stronger against that specific pathogen. We break adaptive immunity into a couple more parts. Uh, we've got humoral immunity, um, and those, that's driven by our B cells, and it's the B cells that make antibodies. Uh, they generate uh, more of themselves and they make antibodies that are very specific to whatever the bug was that they happen to see. Um, and so it's, it's a lock and key relationship. Um, it will develop um, things that can target and eliminate um, uh, 
pathogens quite efficiently, but it's only for that type of pathogen. It also will set aside a little memory, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, but it's that memory that's a, that what is what makes it adaptive. But, so it's, you know, it lays in wait and it's there and it's kind of already primed uh, to respond more efficiently to that same disease should we see it again. After the cell mediated immunity, we have, or after humoral immunity, we have cell mediated immunity and those are our T cells. Um, T cells are really the, the cells responsible for that first early response to infection. Um, T cells are more better suited to target intracellular organisms and viruses by design only replicate when they're inside a, a cell. And so because it's inside the cell, it's hard for antibodies to find those uh, viruses and eliminate them. So we use our T cells for this. Um, T cells also set aside memory. Um, and, the, and I put in here difficult to measure only because you'll know, there's a lot of talk about antibodies, um, lots of talk about antibodies now during this pandemic. Um, antibodies really are only measuring one piece of our immune system. This whole cell mediated side can be evaluated, but it's more difficult and more expensive. And so we tend to look at antibodies as a, as a proxy of protection when we know there's more to it than that. We have local immunity. And local immunity is just buildup of specialized immune cells at places where we're likely to get attacked. It just makes sense that you would build up your military along your borders. And so we've got special cells in our respiratory lining. We've got special cells in our gut lining um, that are there to really, they're just really good at finding foreign invaders and, and alerting the rest of the immune system that something is, is afoot, something is, is, has come in and something's trying to make the animal sick. And I also wanted to highlight that all of these various pieces of the immune system, they talk, they, they, they work together and they coordinate the immune response. Um, so rarely do we see one working without some in, something in conjunction with the others. So the anamnestic response or the immune response, you know, kind of graphically, here's, here's what we're trying to do. Um, you see the y-axis is just the level of immune response and my x-axis is time. And so somewhere along the way, we get an exposure. I call that a primary exposure. The first time the animal has seen this particular pathogen and the immune system responds. It takes a little while. Uh, the animal likely gets sick during this window of time um, if it's an actual you know, real disease. Um, and then you'll see that there's a little, little bit of bump here, a um, little bit of memory is set aside. Now, now that this animal has seen the disease, has it's presented to the immune system. The cells have responded to that immune system. It's made some antibodies. It's made some T cells, and it's going to set a little bit of memory aside uh, that we can we can leverage later if we see this same bug again. And so then there is another exposure that happens it's next time we see this same virus or bacteria. Now, because of the memory, we're able to mount a much more robust, a, a faster immune response. It overwhelms the, this pathogen that's trying to get in, and it does so so fast and so well that we probably didn't even know we, we were exposed. We don't have any of the symptoms of the illness. And so when we're trying to use vaccines, we're trying to elicit this primary response, the arrow on the left, without all the side effects of being ill. So the vaccine delivers a, um, an antigen or a similar type organism to the immune system, allows it to mount to this, this priming mechanism, set aside some memory, so when the real disease comes in, um, even though it's the first time this animal has seen it, it actually is already primed because of, the, because of what the vaccine was able to generate. Um, age of vaccination often comes up as an as a area of concern. And so um, it kind of gets to the, the concept of maternal antibodies and maternal antibody um, blockage. So when a calf gets all of mom's antibodies to all these various diseases, it it's protected against those diseases. Um, and that happens right away as soon as we get that colostrum into her. And over time, those antibodies either get used up or they just break down and they, they go away. Somewhere, um, and, and as long as those antibody levels stay above a certain level, we consider it protective and that, that level will change depending on the, the pathogen. Um, and when it falls below that level of protection, we consider the animal at risk of actually getting the disease because there's not enough circulating to protect her. Uh, then we have the calf's own ability to mount an immune response and make its own antibodies. 
we know that the calf's immune system isn't fully developed at birth. And so it takes a little while before she can do this on her own, before we can start um, using things like vaccines to build her immune system. And so we have this little window here where mom's antibodies aren't quite high enough to keep her healthy. And yet we still can't successfully vaccinate her against the, the various diseases. Um, to make matters worse, uh, we can have enough of mom's antibodies to get in the way of a vaccine response, but um, not enough to keep her healthy if she sees the disease. And that, that's a bit of a conundrum. So this is always kind of a struggle that we think of when we're trying to, when do we start vaccinating our calves? Um, we don't want to waste the vaccine and give it too early, um, but we also don't want to wait so long to give the vaccine to make sure that we get a response that um, we leave the animal um, at risk of, of no protection uh, because we started the vaccine too late. And we like to think that this is the same for every animal, but this, this um, um, immune function, uh, time, to, time to good immune function varies from animal to animal. So um, we kind of, we, we tend to build a little overlap into our vaccine programs knowing, and we'll have to come back and give another one and maybe give another one later on, knowing that maybe some of those initial doses are wasted uh, just because we don't want to leave animals at risk unnecessarily. And we also don't want to rely on a vaccine that's administered so early that we don't have any protection from it. So it does does, does tend to make our young stock vaccine programs um, a little complicated, a little duplicative. Um, just to uh, mention again that um, cell immunity, immunity the T cells, um, it is rather functional in the young calf. And so when we give uh, live vaccines and we can stimulate cell mediated immunity um, in a young calves, we, we, do, we do get a pretty good immune response on the cell mediated branch. And vaccines that are delivered um, to stimulate mucosal immunity, you know, so we have our intranasal vaccines and, and there are some oral vaccines um, that mucosal immunity tends to respond even in the presence of maternal antibodies. So we know that even the very young calves, if, if, if we're delivering antigen in a way that's more likely to work, we can, we can still get some uh, some efficacy from that. So I'm at 45 minutes, so getting near the end here. Um, so quickly, we've got um, passive versus active immunity. Uh, passive immunity, those are antibodies. Um, and so the animal's not mounting an re immune response to that, um, but we're providing some immediate protection, like right away. If I'm giving like an oral uh, capsule of uh, E. coli or rotavirus antibodies, um, colostrum is passive immunity, um, tetanus anatoxin, um, or other kinds of uh, anatoxins. Um, those are immediate, um, but short-lived because the animal's not mounting their own immune response to it. So it gets us through a crisis window. It gives us immediate protection when we need it the most, but it, we're not building any memory. So the, the memory is, the, the immunity is short-lived. Versus active immunity. These are vaccines. So when we say vaccination, this is what we're talking about takes a couple of weeks for these vaccines to build up and to create any protection. Uh, but when we do have memory created, we are creating a, a longer lived uh, immune protection. And then these get broken down into modified live bacter or modified live vaccines, bacterins or toxoids or what we classically call as killed, killed vaccines. So modified live vaccines, uh, they are just that. Uh, these are uh, attenuated strains of, of virus um, that's similar to the pathogen without all the nasty side effects of, of illness associated with the actual pathogen. So by giving live, um, it goes into the animal, it replicates, it is presented to the immune cells just as if the regular uh, bug was there. And so it really gives a good look, the immune system gets a good look at this bug, develops quite a robust immune response. Um, these vaccines uh, tend to be a little less reactive than our killed vaccines. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll even get a little bit of protection e even after one dose. Um, so um, less boostering required with live vaccines. On a cost per dose basis, they do tend to be a little cheaper um, as long as you can get all the doses used. Um, on the downside, um, we can't give this to everybody. Um, there's certain classes of animals who can't receive this. Um, to check your labels, make sure you're using these vaccines correctly. Um, some of these live virus vaccines have given to a pregnant cow incorrectly, it could actually lead to abortion. Once these things are reconstituted, once I, I mix them up and I go to use them, I got to use them up within a couple hours. Um, 
So I can't set this in the fridge and pull it out next week and hope to have any real um, vaccine left. And, and even if um, you know, we, we, we're gonna use it up quickly, but we can still mishandle these products and end up with, with a much poorer vaccine later on. Killed virus vaccines, um, so they are just that. It's, a, it's parts of what's left of the, of the bug. And I give that to the immune system and it will mount an immune response. Uh, these are pretty convenient because they do have a little more um, shelf life in the fridge. Um, so I'm more likely to use all the doses over time. Um, not always though, I mean, if you read your label, it does say you gotta use these things when you first open them. Um, they tend to be safe in all animals. Again, check your labels for which classes of animals these are approved for. Uh, but there's convenience here because I don't have to worry about reconstitution and, and, and trying to decide is it um, safe in pregnant cows and those sorts of things. Uh, the cons, uh, because we put a lot of irritants in killed vaccines to improve their immune response, uh, they can be a little more reactive. Lumps and bumps and anaphylaxis type of, type of things. Uh, with uh, more likely in a killed vaccine product than live. Um, the, because the immune response isn't quite as robust with killed vaccines, um, that's, that's why they add the adjuvants to these, a lot of these products um, to try to drive the immune response better. And most of these products have a booster requirement. Uh, if they've never had this vaccine before, they have to have a, a two dose series or you're really wasting your money with the vaccine. They tend to be a little higher cost per dose, but because you get to likely use more of the doses um, economically, they may come out actually cheaper. So. so we're building vaccination protocols. I mentioned earlier on that we're really trying to um, do a risk assessment and figure out what diseases are we most worried about? Um, what are our capabilities you know, from a labor standpoint and our facilities and access to animals? When can we give these vaccines? And we, we build our protocol accordingly. We're gonna pick our vaccines based on expectation of efficacy, how safe they are in, in our animals. Um, and then we kind of look at that uh, dosing intervals to see um, when do I have to uh, re-administer this vaccine to maintain immunity. And all that information is located on the vaccine insert. Um, so you can just check your check the box. There should be a paper insert there or a fold out on the bottle. The print is incredibly small, but there's lots of really good information on there. Um, we can look at uh, expectation of efficacy based on their label claims. Um, initially, or at least up until 2011, USDA um, would grant five different levels of demonstrated efficacy, and those are listed on your, your vaccine products. And then as of 2011, there's a whole new system in place. Uh, vaccines approved after that. Um, basically, they just get a single label claim, and then we can go on to the USDA APHIS um, website and look up specific products and identify which. Um, and what what kind of efficacy did they demonstrate with their vaccine? Rob? Yes. Uh, as we get uh, here close to the time where we're gonna need to switch, I did have one question that I, I wanted to, to ask. And I think it's a good point to ask that. And as was uh, earlier, you showed kind of core disease qu uh, challenges that we should be considering and perhaps be part of a, a vaccination program. Uh, where does tetanus fall in that for uh, cattle? Yeah, it's a funny thing that tetanus, uh, we don't see very much of it in cattle. Um, it's, we see that more of an issue in our um, small ruminants and, and our equine. So um, I consider it risk-based because even though we don't see a lot of it, we, there are some situations where we, we we're worried enough about it where we would include it in as part of our clostridial combinations. Some of those eight-way, nine-way clostridial vaccines include tetanus toxoid. Do you have a sense that that might be a, a, an important consideration for uh, uh, beef cattle operators or uh, castrating uh, uh, the bull calves? Should that be a consideration? Yeah, some of it's time of year. Some of it is kind of local uh, conditions, but um, it's not unusual at all when I'm cutting bulls uh, that I'm going to include either a tetanus vaccine ahead of time or a tetanus antitoxin because of the timeliness of when I need the protection on board. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just wrapping up, um, ABP just released a vaccination guidelines uh, document for veterinarians to utilize when it comes to how we're deciding to, to use vaccines. And so uh, it's a resource available to uh, veterinarians that are providing your herd health. And then quickly, I just wanted to hit on the things that we tend to run into from a um, protocol problem standpoint. Um, 
And I know Bob already talked about a lot of the communication issues earlier on this afternoon, um, but you know, disorganization and, and protocol drift is probably the thing I see the most when we see problems with vaccine programs. Um, new challenges um, to the herd, new products hitting the market and new people working on the farm somewhere along the way, um, the, the communication isn't there and the vaccination protocol starts to drift and we're, we're not actually following what it is we all agreed on was gonna be the, of the most benefit for the herd. Products can um, expire in the fridge and they, they definitely decline in efficacy as they pass their expiration date. And so um, don't, don't assume that it's still efficacious, um, replace that with, with uh, better dated products. Um, just cold chain management. Um, these vaccines, we know degrade over time and they, their de degradation is accelerated when they're outside of recommended storage temperatures. So um, if they're not um, kept at refrigeration temperature, they are lo losing efficacy at a faster rate. And so things like putting hot colostrum in the same refrigerator um, is going to throw that refrigerator out of whack. Um, putting your vaccine on the door and then leaving, you know, open, every time you open that door, you're exposing that vaccine to warm temperatures. Um, refrigerators that are outdoors, um, these, these, these refrigerators really struggle in those settings, um, both when it's extreme heat in the summer and in the wintertime. Uh, frozen vaccine also is, is not recommended, so it's going to degrade those vaccines. I really like these the thermometers that record high and low temperatures. Um, they're cheap. I think I saw them on Amazon for like 16 to 20 bucks. Uh, put this in the refrigerator that's storing your your colostrum, put this in your refrigerator that's storing vaccine, and you'll see what sort of extremes the inside of the refrigerator sees. Um, I see a lot of missing boosters where boosters should have been part of the protocol and the animals aren't getting those boosters. Um, just not following the label is very common. Um, these vaccines maybe aren't being given by the proper route at the proper dose or in the animals that they were intended to be given to, like a vaccine more designed for beef cattle going into dairy breeds. Um, mishandled vaccines, exposure to sunlight, letting the vaccines get warm, you know, just dirty, dirty uh, injection practices, um, dirty reused needles, things that are really going to increase both side effects and decrease efficacy of your vaccines. Disinfectants um, erode, uh, will, you know, actively kill viruses. So um, well-intended um, people are using disinfectants to clean their um, syringes and things are likely killing um, the live virus particles that, are, that they're drawing up with it. Uh, vaccinating animals in extreme heat, so over 85 degrees in the summer, uh, those animals don't tend to respond very well to vaccine and they may are more likely to react to the vaccine. Um, vaccinating animals that are already sick. And then lastly, just endotoxin overload. Giving too many of certain vaccines at once increases the odds that that animal is going to have an uh, endotoxin overload or an adverse reaction. And those reactions can be anaphylaxis, can be death, can be milk drop, can just be injection site abscesses, injection site uh, lesions, um, or, or just you know looking sick. And so gram-negative vaccines, although these are not all gram-negative organisms, uh, the ones we think of classically are leptos leptospirosis vaccines, our manheimia vaccines, uh, also pasteurella, coliform mastitis vaccines, estophilus, E. coli um, scours vaccines, salmonella vaccines, some of the clostridials, your pink eyes, these are all, we classify them as gram-negative-like, and we want to limit um, giving more than two of these at any one time when we're um, giving, them to, giving them to the animals in the herd. So with that, that's all I prepared. Uh, so with, I don't know, Paul, if we've got a minute or two. Still yeah, for, sure. Any, any, any questions? questions that folks uh, might have, I'll uh, momentarily drop a link to the uh, uh, survey. And you'll also receive an email from Dale Dewing with a link to the one-page online survey. Uh, we'd appreciate if you can fill that out. Are there any questions that folks have for Dr. Lynch? Rob, uh, I guess that last set of slides there did remind me of, uh, we've occasionally, uh, I'll call them, I don't know what to call them, maybe va vaccination train wrecks, but herds that have tried to do the right thing, maybe they haven't had a regular vaccination um, uh, protocol and, and they vaccinate the herd and there's like a, 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 it seems to be a really bad response. Cows might, you know, really be 
off performance or may even get get sick. Is that is that what's going on? Is sort of the toxin overload, or is there something else there to be considering? It can be, um, you know, we, we it can be just a situation of just too much at once. Um, it can be uh, some some clinical illness already there, and you know, I go I go around and I give it to the animals that I thought were were healthy, but some of them may not have been. And so then we're just asking too much of the immune system. Uh, some of it is just, um, we, we notice it when we give it to the whole herd. Like if I go through and vaccinate a herd of 100 milking cows, I'm going to see a dip in that milk tank. I mean, I, that's just the cost of doing business. It's just going to be a, a couple of pounds for a few days per animal um, associated with what the, the energy requirement for that immune response. When I break that out and I'm giving one animal this day and another animal another day, I, it just goes unnoticed. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's a cost of doing business. Um, and we just, you know, we get worried when that, that milk drop is like, you know, up in, you know, four or five pounds and it's per persisting for more than just a couple of days. And that's, we consider that severe and maybe, maybe it was too much at once. Any other questions? Rob? Yes. Um, when I was a herdsman, I once got a rule of thumb in regards to the overload on the gram negatives, um, I think I was told limit your vaccine sequence to only two gram negatives at a time. Uh, is that still germane? Yep. Yeah, I mentioned that. Um, I was going a little quick. It was, yeah, general rule of thumb is no more than two gram negatives at once. And you only have to space that out by a week. So if, you know, I guess this becomes an issue around the dry off time because that's, a, that's some prime real estate for both call for mastitis vaccines, lepto boosters, and scours vaccines. And so now, we've, now I've got too much going on at once. And so if you can just break them out by a week apart, you can minimize that risk. And some herds get, get away with it. They, they're given three, four gram, gram negatives at once and it's where they've never had an issue. It's just, it's all about risk management. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions?